Coming up, he grew up in a broken home. Turned into a home that I didn't even know. And then he created one himself. Because I knew my life was now costing other lives. How he found hope in an unlikely place. I was like, wow, is this is really that easy? Then, the co-host of Breakpoint, John Stone Street opens up his practical guide to culture on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. The United Kingdom has been hit with three terrorist strikes in less than three months. Could the same types of deadly attacks happen here in America to you or to your family? CBN's <laughs> national security correspondent Eric Gonzalez looks at why Europe has suffered from so many of these brutal attacks in recent years and why we also have to be careful here in the United States. While the investigation continues into the UK terror attacks, the United States Department of Homeland Security says it has no evidence of a specific credible terror threat in the United States, but is advising Americans to maintain security awareness. But is maintaining security awareness enough? Just weeks ago, Department of Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly told a media outlet that the American public would never leave their home if they knew what he knew about terrorist threats. So has the U.S. just been lucky? If we don't stop the jihadists, what we see in Europe today will happen in America as well. Former foreign policy advisor to President Trump, Dr. Wally Ferris, says the reasons for more attacks in Europe than the U.S. is partly due to geography. Not only is Europe closer to the Middle East, but jihadis have been migrating there since the 1950s and 60s. Ferris says failures by British intelligence have also allowed radical Muslims to organize. London has been too politically correct because its establishment did not tolerate any criticism of jihadism. And therefore, if you don't stop the jihadists, they're going to grow. And if you don't stop them really, they're going to attack, and that's what they did. He adds, in many cases, British law enforcement has their hands tied because certain actions against specific religious groups might cause political backlash and even scandal. If there is a large Muslim population, if I can get those people off the fence, if I can inspire them to do something, I don't need to go myself. Commander William Marks is with the Defense Intelligence Agency. He says radical Muslims are leaving Europe for training in the Middle East. There they get training in both fighting and communication. Then from there, sometimes they either return back to their, their country of origin or they communicate back to those countries to try to incite terror. Experts say because the United States has been at war with ISIS and Al-Qaeda for years, we've developed tools to detect and vet radicals. But they add Americans must remain on guard and report anything suspicious. Eric Rosales, CBN News. Well, one of the men involved in the London attack Saturday had been known to British authorities. They should have done something about it, but they didn't. John Jessup has that. That's right, Pat. British law enforcement didn't consider that man to be dangerous before he was involved in Saturday night's deadly attack in London. Mark Martin has more. Investigators had known for years that one of the suspected attackers, 27-year-old Karam Butt, wanted strict Islamic Sharia law to be upheld in the UK. A British TV documentary even featured Butt. It was called The Jihadis Next Door, and he'd been seen on TV unfurling an ISIS flag. A neighbor even called an anti-terror hotline to give a tip about his threats. This man's wife had previously reported Butt to police because he had tried to radicalize her children. I don't know what kind of madness took him to do a, such a madness thing and leave a beautiful, two beautiful kids. But I, I, I don't know, I don't know. Experts say these incidents lead officials to ask if they could have stopped the attack. We always ask ourselves, well, should we have known, could this have been prevented? The Saturday night attacks with a van and knife in central London left nearly 60 wounded and seven people dead, including Canadian Chrissy Archibald and James McMullen of London. While our pain will never diminish, it is important for us to all carry on with our lives in direct opposition to those who would try to destroy us. In addition to Karam Butt, a British citizen born in Pakistan, authorities have identified 30-year-old Rashid Radawan as a suspected terrorist in the attack. Both men lived in the same East End London neighborhood. Radawan is from Libya or Morocco. 
Police fatally shot them along with the third identified suspect, 22-year-old Youssef Zagba. He is believed to be an Italian national of Moroccan descent. London's mayor, who is Muslim, spoke directly to terrorists. As a proud and patriotic British Muslim, I say this. You do not commit these disgusting acts in my name. Khan and President Donald Trump got into a minor feud after the attack, with Khan saying the British government should cancel an upcoming state visit by the president. After Trump criticized Khan on Twitter for some of his remarks after the attacks, but British Prime Minister Theresa May stood by the London mayor without commenting on the president's statements. After the deadly tragedy in London coming on the heels of other recent terrorist attacks in the UK, the top British counterterrorism official says authorities plan to dramatically change their strategy. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Pat, back to you. Well, as I've said on this program before, I say it again, uh, ISIS is a cancer that needs to be removed. You know, if you have cancer in your body, you either treat it with chemo or you do surgery, but you get rid of it. And that thing in Raqqa is a cancer. Now I understand that we have got forces moving in uh, against Raqqa, but we need to destroy ISIS, literally destroy it. And it's not a question of bringing them to justice. It's a question is of just eliminating them. It, they're brutal, and they need to be dealt with with brutality. We need to get rid of them. And that means that center of, of uh, poison has got to be eliminated. And then we need to root out all their, their branches around the world. And they have spread and metastasized in an incredible fashion, from just a few th people to tens of thousands of them now, and more and more and more. As long as it looks like they're winning, then people want to get on board. It's got to be shown to the world they're not winners. And what the president said was exactly right. They're a bunch of losers. We need to show them as losers. John. Pat, back here at home, a 25-year-old woman has been charged with leaking a classified report with top-secret information into the investigation on Russian interference in last year's election. Reality Winner was a contractor for the National Security Agency. She is the first person charged in a case involving leaks under President Trump's administration, showing that the government will be going after those who leak. The website The Intercept reported Monday that it had obtained an NSA document saying Russian hackers attacked at least one U.S. voting software supplier just days before the election. The story also said the NSA report did not indicate that the voting machines or votes had been compromised. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court did not review an appeal from a Christian Marine who was punished for posting a Bible verse in her office. Lance Corporal Monifa Sterling was court-martialed and given a bad conduct discharge after refusing to remove the verse. Monday's decision upholds lower court rulings, stating that her superiors did not place a, quote, substantial burden on her First Amendment right to religious expression. Sterling's legal team disagrees with the court's decision, saying they will work even harder to ensure religious freedom for U.S. service members. Well, kids across America are enslaved in a life of prostitution through human trafficking, but many are working to set them free. Paul Strand brings us a story of one group whose unique approach includes a simple household item. This room filled with the bustle of volunteers stuffing bags prominently labeled soap. It's to fight sex trafficking, the second leading crime in America. There's a group trying to do something about sex trafficking called soap. Save our adolescents from prostitution. Soap. And they've actually found a way to use soap. The bags are filled with bars of soap that have the phone number for the National Human Trafficking Hotline on the wrapper. The volunteers carry them to hotels and motels all around the Washington, D.C. area. Soap founder Teresa Flores got a text from someone who told her the soap wrapper had been a success. And it said, you are the reason I'm free. I found a bar of soap in Chicago and it gave me a uh, um, reason to get out. The volunteers gave out folders containing warning signs for desk clerks to watch out for and also photos of missing girls who might be among the potentially thousands of sex trafficking victims in the U.S. right now. Flores was around when a photo of a missing girl worked recently. And the um, clerk said she just checked in 20 minutes ago with an older man, and she's 15, right? And so we were able to call the authorities and go get her immediately. Barbara Amaya was sex trafficked from the age of 12 to 22. She says children are a favorite among those who pay for sex. And I was trafficked in the streets of New York from the age of 12 to 21 or 22. Not once did anyone, not once did any one of those men ever say, 
wait a minute, hold on, you're just too young. Flores was sex trafficked too and says the damage never really goes away. It's lifelong. It, when you are trafficked, if, if it's for a weekend, if it's for two years or, or five years, it doesn't matter. Uh, you are really broken um, for forever and it takes a lot to heal. You may think you don't have any tools to fight sex trafficking, but it could be as simple as a piece of paper or a bar of soap. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Arlington, Virginia. Thanks, Paul. Lawmakers in the Senate are urging President Trump to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The Senate voted 90 to nothing Monday night on a resolution honoring the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem during the Six-Day War in 1967. The resolution also calls on the president and all U.S. officials to abide by a 1995 law that urged then-President Bill Clinton to move the embassy. White House officials say it's only a matter of when, not if, the president follows through on his campaign promise to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Pat, back to you. Well, I think armed with that kind of uh, bipartisan vote in the Senate, the president can just very easily say, look, the United States Congress has spoken. The United States uh, of America stands by our friends in Israel, and we acknowledge that Jerusalem is their capital. And I think it would be a non-event. Uh, there's nobody going to demonstrate on account of that. It's not going to destroy our relationship with the Arabs. I mean, let's face it, that's where the capital of Israel is. It's Jerusalem. The government offices of the nation of Israel are located in Jerusalem. And for us to go through this fiction of saying, well, it's really in Tel Aviv, is just nonsense. So the State Department has been so afraid of, of, of uh, the Arab backlash, but there's not going to be any backlash. Well, what are they going to do? Yeah, the Russians have already done it. So we've got cover now, the United States Senate and the Russians. So it doesn't take a lot of bravery to move the embassy and do what we should have done a long time ago. Terry, it's a good day. It is a good day. It's a great day, a actually. Great day. And here's right. one of the reasons why, All speaking right. of Israel, we have had an overwhelming response at the box office and sold out theaters across the nation for CBN's docudrama on the Six Day War. So Fathom Events is extending the film In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem, for one final night, and that night is tonight, June the 6th, in select theaters. This is your last chance to see CBN's docudrama on the Six Day War on the big screen. So if you'd like to get tickets, just go to inourhands1967.com. Well worth your time. You'll appreciate yeah. it. Before mm -hmm. you uh, go to the next thing, I want to point out to people who live, I believe, in New Jersey and Virginia, we've got a couple of primaries coming up that may have a considerable significance in selecting uh, future leaders. And I would urge people to make their plans to vote. It's the 13th, I believe, of June coming up. So just a week. So some significant positions being filled. Really? Well, I mean, governors. I mean, the governor of Virginia, the governor of New Jersey. And uh, uh, I mean, th these are uh, for uh, the uh, particular uh, Republican or, or independent or, de or Democrat. But nevertheless, their party positions, but these will go into the general election as the candidates. So it's very important. And so uh, there hasn't been a lot of publicity about it, but I think if you live in those two states, you ought to make your plan to vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, up next, inside the free clinics that are delivering quality health care at no cost. It is probably the best job I never got paid for. See how these health centers are saving lives when we come back. Well, chances are you know someone who doesn't have health insurance or people who can't afford the rising premiums. But as Laurie Johnson shows us, there is hope for those caught in those terrible situations. On Thursday nights, the Helping Hands Free Clinic in Columbus, Ohio, provides much needed care for those who can't pay for it. It all begins with patients and workers joining in prayer. So we bring this time of clinic to you and pray for your healing for everyone concerned. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Scattered across the Buckeye State, volunteers operate a total of 100 free clinics in both big cities and small towns. 
It is probably the best job I never got paid for. There. <laughs> a steady stream of patients walk in off the street, sometimes hours before the doors even open. Many free health clinics are operated by churches who feel it's part of their mission to meet the physical needs of people in the community. In the process, they often meet their spiritual needs as well. Compared to major metropolitan cities, Columbus reports the second highest percentage of new foreign-born residents. We want people to see that we are the helping hands of Jesus in what we do. Uh, we have a lot of Muslims that come to this clinic and we want them to see our Christian faith and see that we'll treat everybody equally and just feel the love. And they do come and pray with us sometimes. Patients get free antibiotics and other medications, but no narcotics. It was a really good experience. They were really friendly. They even prayed with me, which I really, really enjoyed. While donations cover expenses, it's the tireless volunteers who really keep the clinics going. And most of them have worked all day. And then they'll come in and they'll do you know, four or five, six hours of volunteer work in the evenings. We're talking nurses, social workers, physical therapists, and of course, doctors. I've been given so much in my life, and I'm loved so much by Christ. And I just want to turn that love around and reflect it. Free clinics also rely on non-medical volunteers, like Lois Honecker. This clinic helped save her life as a patient. I was a total mess. I'm a diabetic and I was, it was, it was out of control, the blood pressure was out of control, the whole nine yards. Most free clinics open one night a week to offer primary care and can also refer patients to specialists, like those at this free dental clinic across town at Vineyard Church. Since these visits typically last a while, patients are only seen by appointment. If I can use some of my talents to help other people, to just keep all of the stuff I do and my time to myself, I feel like would be selfish and not glorifying to God. So I try to give back to, to him ultimately, but to people as well. In addition to the Thursday Dental Clinic, Vineyard Church offers free options for vision, chiropractic, and general health on other nights. Although churches typically operate free clinics, they're not all faith-based. This is the Columbus Free Clinic. It is staffed by volunteers from the Ohio State School of Medicine. The resident physicians who already work long hours still find time to help. There's always changes in place trying to increase access to the medical care, and I think we're, we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, Columbus, Ohio, and the sort of greater Columbus area still has a pretty large uninsured population that um, really kind of falls through the cracks. People like Michael Watson, who's been here four times for a number of health issues. Oh, this is wonderful. I've been pleased with the, you know, the service and the the, the nurses are very knowledgeable and, the, and the, the doctors and everything, and they've been, been nice and really helped me quite a bit. For Michael, health insurance was out of the question. I couldn't afford, you know, the the monthly payments on it, or, you know, if I did get sick, the, the deductible is offered through my work, but it would have been my whole paycheck. So while the future of health care is uncertain, the need for free clinics will likely continue, backed by donations and volunteers to keep them running. Lori Johnson, CBN News. You know, we are a very generous nation, and I think the reason is that we were founded as a Christian nation, and uh, we have taken the biblical mandate to help the poor and the needy, and uh, those clinics are just an example of it. But what a heartwarming thing. Uh, people don't have to be trapped into some kind of bureaucratic uh, maze that they, they can be free because of the help of, of people, just ordinary folks who have skills that they will make, make available to those who are less fortunate. Well, Terry has an interesting story. Let's get it. I do. Coming up, he was a hopeless alcoholic and tired of ruining his life. At that moment, felt a sense of brokenness that I never felt before. Everybody I let down was probably just better off without me. See how he had a change of heart just by changing the channel. David Kern's dad was a raging alcoholic. 
Years later, David headed down the same road. He was staring at a divorce and yet another charge for DUI. And then one day, as David contemplated his own death, he turned on the TV set. And what he saw there saved his life. You know, I see my mother and my sister drive off. That's kind of when everything, my life, went down with his. Eight-year-old David Kern never thought his parents would divorce, but the signs were there. I noticed my mother and father started arguing more. I noticed the fights started getting more violent. My father started getting more violent. His father's discipline had also become more harsh, but David held on to the good memories before things got bad. I had a lot of respect for my father. I loved my father. He was abusive, but I still loved my father, so we had that, you know, we had that connection. So it was decided he would stay with his dad while his two sisters went with their mom. From there, the abuse and drinking only got worse. He started going to the bars every night. The house started getting louder. Sex in the house turned into a home that I didn't even know. And not only that, there was mental abuse. You're a flunky. You're a loser. At 11, David started drinking and smoking pot because, according to his dad, it was the cool thing to do. On the weekends, he stayed with his mom, who tried talking to him about God, but he was too angry and hurt to listen. He'd always encourage with Bibles and God has plans, things happen for a reason, and all this stuff you don't want to hear. Even if there is a God, where is he at? You know, why, why is this happening? In 11th grade, he dropped out of school and became a small-time drug dealer. He left his dad's and bounced in and out of drug houses and was arrested numerous times. Like his dad, he felt life was hopeless. Your mother's gone, your father's abusive. You don't know what life is. You have no value of life. I had no value for life. That is until David's girlfriend told him she was pregnant. As he prepared to be a father, he felt something he'd never felt before. Yeah, there was a hope, yeah. That life was gonna change and when I seen the heartbeat, it's like, wow. This is where my life is really headed now. You know, this is where it's really going. Then, without notice, his girlfriend got an abortion. David was crushed and felt that in some way, he was to blame. I had to get away, because I knew my life was now costing other lives. And that's when I really started first realizing that there needed to be a change in my life, that you know I needed to do something with my life. David earned his GED, joined the Army Reserves, and took a job at a steel factory. But it was when he married and had two sons that he felt he had found what he'd been looking for. I always started trying to find that hope, that it was all about family, it was all about finding someone to marry, having kids, and that would settle you down. David loved his sons and was never abusive, but he never got over his need for alcohol. He and his wife argued constantly and eventually filed for divorce. When the separation finally happened and everything started coming to fruition um, is when I pushed it farther away and I went to the only thing that I knew how, and that was back to the bar scene, back to drinking, even more so. While waiting on the divorce settlement, they shared custody of their boys. When my sons were around, I held it together. It's when they weren't around that I, that I went off. One night, David was arrested and jailed for driving while intoxicated. The divorce hearing was only weeks away and David feared he would lose all custody of his sons. And I automatically, at that moment, felt a sense of brokenness that I'd never, never felt before. My sons were really on my heart, like, what are they gonna do? How is this gonna all get fixed? What's gonna happen here? After his arraignment, David posted bail and went home to await trial. Millions of thoughts went through my mind on what to do, that I wasn't good enough to be a father. Everybody I let down was probably just better off without me. David turned on the television looking for a distraction. Instead, he found a message of hope. The 700 Club was on and Pat Robertson was ministering. Would you like that love? At the end, when he said, you have two ways to go right now, you can go the way you're going, or you can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and choose the life that he has for you. I was like, wow, is it is, is really that easy? Because I never heard that it was that easy before. So I went in my back room kneeled down, prayed. Lord Jesus, I believe you, I need you. It was a need, it was a hunger, a thirst that I've never felt before. 
I remember I rose and I felt free for the first time. Like everything was gonna be fine. I was like, this was, this was like a wow factor. You know, everything was gonna truly be okay. David got himself into a rehab facility where he started reading his Bible and praying. And he discovered the true meaning of being a man and father. I didn't have a father figure to look up to, but I had God. And wow, did he reveal his true identity to me. And through that time, he equipped me to be a better father, to be everything that my sons needed. So all that fear was gone. All that fear of what's ahead was gone. You know, all that fear of who I was gonna be was gone. Freed from his addictions, David showed up to his pretrial a changed man. The judge counted his rehab as time served and dropped the charges. Two weeks later, he was in front of a judge again, this time for a custody hearing. Wore my faith on my sleeve and told the judge everything about my faith, everything about my newfound hope and my plans. And, and yeah, so two weeks later, I get a phone call from an attorney that I run one residential parenting, right? So it was shared parenting, but they were gonna, they were allowed to go to school where I was residing. Today, David is a pastor and ministers to people suffering from addictions. He's married to Rhonda, and together they're teaching their family whose example they need to follow above all. I'm encouraging, I love them, I'm their buddy, I'm their dad, I'm their friend, but they know that there's one over me and that's their father in heaven. And that's why I am who I am today. You know, I was reading uh, the Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He said, you know, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom. There's liberty. And David was hooked by images of his bad father, images of drug addiction, images of alcoholism. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And God came to set you free. Jesus came to set you free, and you should not be in bondage. God didn't make you to be a slave. God made you to be free, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. <clears throat> and you want to be free, and I want you to be free, and God wants you to be free. But you've been enslaved to so many things. You can be enslaved to hatred. You can be enslaved to fear. You can be enslaved to bad memories, and you can go on down the list of the things that have enslaved you. But I want to tell you right now, the Spirit of the Lord is here, and the Spirit of the Lord will set you free. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Now, if you want that, if you want to be touched by His Spirit, I want you to pray with me right now. Right at this moment, pray these words. Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Jesus, I come to you right now, and I confess, Lord, that you are God. I confess that the Spirit of God is in you, and you are the Spirit of God. I speak those words. I want you, Lord, and Spirit of the Holy God, I pray right now that you will come into my heart Fill me with yourself. Reveal to me the Father. And from this moment on, I am yours. I will give you my life. And I receive that freedom from this moment on. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me, that's a big deal. You know, you have asked God to come into your life, and you're going to start a whole new adventure with him. A new adventure. I have a little packet called A New Day, I'll be glad to give you. It has a little booklet in it, and a DVD, I mean a CD. It'll tell you what you just did. But the profound mystery of God is at work in you from this moment on. The profound mystery of the Holy Spirit of God is at work in you, and you are free because you belong to Him. Now, you do need to do something, if you would, please. You need to confess what you've just done. And I have telephone available for you free. It's a toll-free number, 700-7000. And you can call in. Just say, look, I just prayed. I've just given my heart to the Lord. If you want to give us your name, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. If you want to give us your name, we'll send you some stuff that you can read. If you don't want it, that's cool. But call and tell somebody. You are free, and the Spirit of the Lord has set you free. 
You're a free man, a free woman, a free boy, a free girl in Jesus' name. Terry. Still ahead, the book every parent needs to read. John Jones Street shares how you can help their children. We can all help our children navigate the culture wars we're in. That's next. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Jews and Christians are coming together to celebrate the reunification of Jerusalem. 50 years ago today, Jewish paratroopers captured the Temple Mount, one of the holiest sites for Jews and Christians. In Dallas, Texas, the American Alliance for Jews and Christians will gather at City Hall for a rally for Jerusalem at 4 p.m. Reverend Daniel Lappin told CBN News, it's only right that believers of both faiths celebrate together. To a huge number of Americans, uh, Jerusalem is far more important a city than, than Jacksonville or Jakarta or Johannesburg are. Uh, it's, it's a city in which the spiritual hopes and aspirations of Jews and Christians has resided for centuries, for millennia. Very important day indeed. And you can find more information about today's rally on our website, cbnnews.com. Well, CBN is reaching out to the local community with help on finding jobs, taking care of health and family, and much more. CBN and Park Place Empowerment Center hosted a community fair this weekend in Norfolk, Virginia. It was called LAUNCH, which stands for Learning, Access, Unity, Nutrition, Career, and Health. It included job training signups along with free health and dental checks and family counseling. The event included family entertainment such as live gospel, jazz and rap music, superbook movies, cooking demonstrations, and much, much more. It was a great time for everyone. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with much more of the 700 Club right after this. Bob Dylan once sang, the times, they are a-changing. Of course, that was more than 50 years ago, and the times have certainly changed since then. What was once taboo has made it into the mainstream, and who knows what's going to happen in another generation. But as John Stone Street explains, there's a way that we can still stand strong. John Stone Street is the co-host of Breaking Point, a Christian radio show founded by the late Chuck Colson. He's also president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. John says America's views on issues like gender identity, technology, and abortion are changing. That means parents, pastors, and mentors are faced with a difficult challenge. They must prepare young Christians to face a confusing world. In his new book, A Practical Guide to Culture, he shares how we can equip the next generation to change the world even in uncertain times. Well, John Stone Street is here with us now, and what a great book, A Practical Guide to Culture. John, it's good to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be on with you. Will you define, so that we're all on the same terms here, will you define culture? Well, that's one of the most important questions to start with, because culture is one of those often used yeah. but rarely defined words. Uh, culture is what humans do with the world. Sometimes Christians define culture as all the bad stuff that's out there, uh, but that's not true. It's also work and it's business and so on, but, but culture is the force around Around us, it shapes our thinking and it shapes our, 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 our mind, uh, shapes how we behave. And uh, parents know that a lot of things have changed in a short amount of time. And we also know that we should have the ability to somehow impact right. culture for our children. But talk a little bit. You say in the book that there are undercurrents in right. our culture that we may not know about. You know, in the book, we, we we cover some what we call cultural waves. These are the ones you feel. We've been all been on the side of the ocean and got knocked by a wave. And you talk about things like same-sex marriage or or uh, racism or addiction. The These obvious. are the obvious mm -hmm. things. But we've also had the experience of being uh, in the ocean and finding ourselves 20 yards down the beach and what, what, what happened, happened, right? Yes. And it's the undercurrents. And there's been a lot of undercurrents in our culture for the last 20 or 40 years that have created the cultural waves that we now feel. So as a parent, as a mentor, as an educator, if we're going to help the next generation deal with the waves, we 
we need to understand the undercurrents as well. So what are some of those undercurrents? You know, one of those is just the fact that we live in what's called the age of information, yeah. right? When you, know, I were, you and I were growing up, if we had a question, our parents would say, go look it up. Yeah. And they meant <laughs> and a you book. you had the encyclopedias yes, right. right there. On and the that was an authoritative <laughs> source. Yes. Today, looking it up means going to Google. And mm. Google's going to give us whatever its algorithms say. Yeah. Well, all this translates to the fact that all the information we have doesn't mean the same thing as wisdom. Mm -hmm. So navigating uh, through a, a maze of information and trying to find truth, that's one of the undercurrents. Another one is what, uh, interestingly enough, Senator Ben Sass wrote about just recently, which is perpetual adolescence. Yes. Adolescence used to be considered 13 to 18. Today it's considered 11 to 30. It's, a, you know, there's words for it, like Peter Pan syndrome, or my, fa my favorite is failure to launch, right? <laughs> we have high schoolers that become 20-somethings, that become 30-somethings, but don't grow up. They don't yeah. take on responsibility. They don't um, move out of their parents' house. One of the things is they delay marriage longer and longer mm -hmm. and longer. So that's another undercurrent uh, that we face. Um, and then there, there's, there's a number of other ones. One is just the lack of virtue. Right. We, we now talk about a lot about values. You have Republican values or Democrat values, conservative or liberal values. And we need to have our values straight. Mm -hmm. But connecting what we believe with how we live, the integrated life, as C.S. Lewis talked about, yes. being a man with a chest is what how he phrased it. Uh, having uh, character, the character formation. Uh, we have a lot of uh, solutions in life today that are very easy, very quick, very convenient, but not the long, hard work of developing character. Well, when you talk about something like character, I think that's where parents get confused because you, with the culture Has changed. swirling around right. us and the values changing and and even the definition of what is truth changing. Right. How do we impart that to our children? What what do you speak to parents in this day and age? Yeah, you know, in, in the the fourth chapter, or the, sorry, the fourth section of the book, we spend a lot of time on scripture. I think the challenge of every Christian is to keep straight the moment and the story. Mm -hmm. We live in a cultural moment, and there's a lot going on. Uh, we have brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that live in a cultural moment where there's great persecution and great oppression. And yet the most true thing about any cultural moment, theirs, ours, any generation of Christians throughout history, is what we find in the story of Scripture, centered in the person of Jesus Christ, that Christ is risen. So there's no possible way to have an answer to each and every question, even knowing what our kids are going to face. Mm -hmm. But grounding them with a trust in the authority of Scripture, helping them understand that Scripture is not just a collection of random moral McNuggets that we can take and pick and choose from, but it's this grand story that, 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 that gives us the context of our current cultural moment. Yeah. It gives us truth with a capital T. No substitute for that if our kids are going to well, survive. That's the truth. And, and then walking it out ourselves. That's right. I mean, I, you know, I, I talk about parents and kids, but, but really for us as adults, the ones who are supposed to lead, who are supposed to, to sh picture mm -hmm. all of this for kids, how do we inoculate ourselves? I mean, certainly scripture is the beginning and the basis for all of that. But what are some other ways that we can be aware of what we need to do in regard to values? You know, we wanted this book to be very practical, and, and that included how do we develop a Christian worldview ourselves so that we can understand culture. One of the easiest ways, uh, I don't say easy, but one of the most helpful ways is being very uh, careful about the definition of words. Yeah. Now, that sounds strange, but here's what I mean. Um, sometimes in a culture, we'll find ourselves, sometimes as parents with our kids, we'll find ourselves also using the same uh, vocabulary, but not the same dictionary. I once had a conversation with a woman on an airplane who said, who was, told me she was an atheist. She said, how can you believe in God? And I asked a question, what do you mean by God? Mm -hmm. She said, a grumpy old man with a beard in the sky <laughs> who wants to strike you with a lightning bolt. I said, well, I don't believe in Zeus, right? That's yeah. not the God. And so starting with that question, what do you mean by that? When you talk about words like love and truth and freedom and God mm -hmm. and male and female and marriage and family, these are essential first steps to making sure that we have the right dictionary in understanding the culture. And as we do that as adults, we can do that with our kids. So it's not only that we do it so that our kids can watch, it's that we do it so that we can walk with our kids into the culture. You know, there's so much anger today yeah. in our culture. Some of that, I think, comes from the fact that 
that we are confused and mm -hmm. people are frustrated and they don't know how to change that up. Just want to thank you for the book. It's an amazing guide to all of that. And um, there's so much that we haven't touched on here that's in here. It's a deep book. I mean, you need to read it and think about it <laughs> and then do something with it in your life. It's called A Practical Guide to Culture, helping the next generation navigate today's world. You know, we can't help them if we don't help ourselves first. It's available in stores nationwide. Highly recommend it. John, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lots of food to chew on there. Well, still to come, we're going to be answering your email questions. Gabby says, I know I married the wrong person, and I think I've met the person I was supposed to marry, even though I wasn't looking. Do I resist and continue to live with the wrong one? Another round of Bring It On's coming up. Pat will solve that one. Don't go away. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. After Lelia's husband died, she struggled to support her three children. Soon the family had no heat, no electricity, no running water. That's when Lelia, who was still grieving for her husband, found out that she might lose her children as well. Lelia and her three children live in Transnistria near Moldova. They work hard to keep their small home tidy and their garden well tended. They're just happy to be together because not long ago, they were almost torn apart. They wanted to take us away from our mother. It had only been a few months since Lilia and her children had faced another tragic loss. When my husband died, I did not want to leave. Lilia struggled to support her family, and her home fell into disrepair. They had no heat, no electricity, and no running water. But despite their desperate living conditions, Lilia's children remained devoted to her. She is my mother. She gave us life. I love her very, very much. I only wanted one thing, that my kids would be near me, that they could go to school and live normally. Government social workers heard about the family's living conditions and came with an ultimatum. Make improvements in one week or we will take your children. I was so afraid that I will lose my mother forever. That's when CBN's Orphan's Promise stepped in. We heard about Lilia and her children from a local church partner in our Keeping Families Together program. We began the needed repairs to Lilia's house immediately. They helped us to make repairs. They brought seeds and all the tools we needed to plant a garden. They gave us food as we wait for our garden to grow and two piglets. We also repaired their oven and fence and connected their house to clean running water and to ensure that their home will never be lost to foreclosure. We help provide the funds to pay it off completely. Oh, thank you. It's ours now. I will have more opportunities for work. Thank you very much for everything. You know, Orphan's Promise is CBN's outreach to orphaned and vulnerable children around the world. Why do we have a Keeping Families Together program? Because when we're able to do this, we keep children from going into institutions and orphanages. They're meant to be in families. That's a God plan. We want to say thank you, 700 Club members. You make it possible for us to step into the needs of people like Lilia and her children. They are together. They are happy. They are healthy. They are fed. They have hope. And how do you put a price tag on that? You know, to become a 700 Club member is just 65 cents a day, $20 a month. We can do that, and we can do all of this together when we link arms. So will you join the 700 Club today? Our number's toll-free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Listen, we've got a gift for you when you do. Miracles. This is our latest DVD, and you're going to love it because it's filled with the miracle power of God in the lives of people who have seen complete restoration and healing. It'll build your faith, and at the same time, you'll have the privilege of knowing that you are helping people who are in desperate need, like Lilia. Here's Mary. She's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
Mary said, I absolutely loved miracles. It's so important to reinforce what the power of God can do for believers and non-believers. Thank you. And you know, that's what miracles is you know, full of. As I watch that family, I, you know, the Bible says, he pled the cause of the poor and the needy. Is that not what it means to know me, says the Lord? That's how you know God, is when you reach out to those poor people and to, to see the joy of that woman and her children. Oh, man. It's, I mean, you know, it, Pat, I've also, in <clears throat> the travels that I've done for yeah. CBN, have stood in orphanages and watched children when they're being processed in and they've been taken from their parents. Oh. And it's a sorry sight. Oh, I mean, the fear and the anxiety and oh. the anger, it sets them up for well, failure. If we can be there to help, but think, is Amen. not this what it means to know me? Hey, I've got a little quick mea culpa. Uh, the producer said, uh, I erred. You know, I never make mistakes. <laughs> shocking. It's shocking. How dare he say that? It looks like the election to replace Governor Christie, which is the uh, election in, mm. in New Jersey, New Jersey. The, uh, is today. Oh, wow. Uh, Virginia is next week. I thought they were both next week. But New Jersey, according to my eminent producer, and I hope he's right, is today. Mm -hmm. And if he's wrong, then it'll, it'll be his fault. So still time to get your coat on and get out there. Here, here <laughs> in Jersey, I mean, it's, it's a primary, and, and Virginia is a primary. It's not the general election. It's a primary next Tuesday. So make your vote count. All right, let's go. Okay, time to bring it on. This is from Gabby, Pat, who says, what if you knew you married the wrong person and you've been praying for years that God would change you both and make you into what each other needs, then while not, you find the person, I think she means while not looking, you find the person you were supposed to marry. You're both Christians who love the Lord and try to resist. Do you live with the wrong person because you are committed to God? You know, I know that's a tough question, but the truth is you swore vows. You, you, you it was said something before a minister, uh, till death do us part and all that. And uh, I'll honor and love mm -hmm. and cherish and all that. So 20 years later, 10 years later, you say, well, hey, it's the wrong one. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, if you've committed, you've committed. I know that's tough. Uh, and, you know, but uh, I don't know what else to say, but that, that's the rule. You ask me the rules, and that's the rules. But it's painful, yeah. granted. But this business, I've just found my soulmate 10 years after I've been married, and he's not my husband. I don't buy that. All right, what else? Okay, this is Danielle, who says, My church preaches often on wives submitting to their husbands. I believe that this is a biblical truth that should be practiced in every marriage. The problem is that I believe that my husband disregards a lot of advice I give him because of this. It's concerning because I've advised him that he shouldn't call in sick to work most every week, and he still does. Because of this, we're now having financial problems. We go without food or gas often. I've talked to him about solutions to our problems, but it falls on a deaf ear. I've stopped advising him and have practiced submitting to him and praying to God that this situation will get better. He's great on many areas of our marriage. I currently let him handle all the finances, but just want to see the cycle of lack broken in our marriage. What can I do? Well, you know, the Bible says if anybody won't look after his own, he's worse than an infidel. Um, you know, there are a lot of men who are not as capable as their wives are in handling money. And you look at the 30th chapter of Proverbs and you see what a woman can do. I mean, she runs the fairs, buys a field, gives tasks to her maidens and all the rest of it. Um, th this guy uh, apparently is a loser. And I don't know, you say you want to submit to him, and that's very noble. But <clears throat> if a man goes out of the will of God, in my opinion, he loses the headship that God gives him. Because Jesus is the head and then the man in turn, the head of the woman, and the mother and father, head of the children. That, that's that divine order. But if any of them step out of that order, then of course that, that mantle of anointing, in a sense, has left them. So you ask, what are you supposed to do? All I can say is pray, get counseling, and see if something that will be a transformation in your husband. I, I don't know what else to tell you. You ought to have counseling, and maybe, maybe he said he's good in certain areas. Why don't you see if you can't find some reconciliation to see if he suddenly would wake up and do it right. Well, we leave you with our power minute from Psalms. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Well, for Wendy and for Terry and for all of us, this is Pat Robertson. And uh, we thank you for being with us. 
as we look forward to another exciting 700 Club tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye.